Hi, everyone. So we'll talk about CDF frame format now. Um, my name is Indu. Uh, this is a joint um, work contribution by two people, myself and Vayman Pan. Both of us are uh, in the Linux toolchain team at Oracle. Mm. For much of the last year, we have been working on the CTF frame format and its implementation in bin utils. Um, and we have gotten feedback from people inside and outside of Oracle. It's been really helpful, so thank you. Um, so today, let's talk a little bit. Let's start off by just um, talking about what are the use cases of backtracing out in the wild and what are the requirements. So as you look at different use cases, you see that the requirements really are very different. And, um, and I talk about all that so that I can put CTF frame in perspective and hopefully give you an idea about the value proposition of CTF frame format. And then I'll talk about the implementation aspects and bin utils. And you can ask questions throughout the presentation, but maybe we take them at each of these you know, different snapshots or checkpoints. Um, and towards the end, we can, we'll talk about next steps. So any feedback, good, bad, ugly, it's all good. So um, yeah. So in general, you see that there are a lot of um, the different use cases of backtracing. You see profilers, crash reporters, or say debuggers. And um, so I categorize them into these two different categories just to set a perspective. Um, so the use cases of online backtracers are where the application is in a production-like environment. And any cost that you incur for unwinding is, um, it affects the application. So cost in terms of CPU, of course, and any memory. So you might have to load some extra debug sections. Um, if at all, you need to go to, you know, maybe like debug information for call sites and stuff. So all those costs of CPU and memory add up and affect the running application. In the case of offline, this doesn't seem to be the case. Um, offline is more like off, you know, um, after the fact sort of analysis, um, and debuggers fall in this category. So then let's talk about what are the common requirements for um, online backtracers. So in all these cases, asynchronousity is important. You do want to backtrace from any given PC all the time. Well, okay, let's define it like that. And then uh, the unwinder itself needs to be very fast and precise. And in some cases, precision is very important. For example, for live patching, um, you do want the backtraces to be really reliable. If not, maybe have a method to you know mark it or so. And uh, so this row of this, this requirement of fast, precise, asynchronous basically translates to saying that um, the requirement really is to have a small unwinder and preferably small debug info. And, and now contrasted to the use cases of offline um, backtracers. So here I put all of these in a um, I I, def, I uh, categorize them as good to have. Now this is also, well, maybe arguable because, I don't know, asynchronous, you, 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 lose the, you lose the usefulness of backtraces pretty quickly as soon as you lose some asynchronicity. But irrespective of that, I think the point that I want to convey in this slide is that there are really a variety of backtracers out there, that, a variety of use cases where you want to backtrace. And if you look at the use cases of online backtracers, the requirements are much more stringent. And this is where CDF frame would like to help out. And the last row that I put here is the requirement of original value of backtracers. Oh, sorry, original value of arguments. Um, some backtracers, uh, some applications that we know of have, re have requested this feature. So we want to target it as well. And uh, so that's why I also put it in online, because that use case that we know of is an online backtracer. And it will be good to support that requirement. So having said that, um, there are current solutions, right? We know of current solutions. Frame pointers used to be the one. And then now we have mostly EH frame-based uh, backtracers. But the usual complaint against uh, EH frame-based um, backtracers is that they are slow and they are large. So usually when you want to unwind using the debug information contained in these EH frame sections, you need to have a small stack machine implementation that can uh, interpret these dwarf opcodes, figure out the stack offsets, and then unwind. So this whole activity becomes a little bit 
more CPU intensive than desirable. And um, now let's look at the requirement where you want to figure out the original value of the arguments. So in those, whenever you do want to then figure out the original value of the arguments, it gets difficult because now for the, the state of the art here for original value of the arguments is um, going to debug in for section, for example, and getting call site um, data. So it gets difficult combined with all of this. It gets difficult to um, backtrace using EH frame, and this is leading to a pattern that can be seen across applications, which where uh, many of these applications are coming up with their own unwind format and uh, adopting a solution where the generation of these unwind formats is out of the tool chain, right? And this is, uh, this is so, so far I've come across three different, but I'm, I bet there are more, um, three different, you know, different um, unwind formats, um, ad hoc unwind formats, which are not supported in tool chain, but the use case is plain vanilla backtracing, plain vanilla stack unwinding, do not recover the state, but just give me, you know, uh, the return, just walk the stack and just tell me where the execution stack was at different points in time. So the issues with these ad hoc formats, as I said, are not very hard to, you know, uh, guess. Um, so most of these solutions that have adopted their own unwind formats have uh, a mechanism where they actually use their own um, tool sets to reverse engineer the binaries. And yes, so there are, there are going to be problems with that. So the way to do it, the way they would do it is go to the binary, figure, decode the instructions, figure out the stack usages and so on. So at some point, yeah, you go from one architecture to the next, you have a problem. And at some point you'll say, oh, I need to figure out the control flow. Well, you have a second problem. And then, yeah, in some solutions we have seen that there are these um, code patterns that they will try to, um, it's almost like pattern matching. So you figure out a few specific sequences of instructions and then you take some action based on that and basically learn that if this is the pattern, I bet I have to unwind it like this. So this, all of this makes it very, a big ordeal to, un, to simply unwind, right? And um, it is clear when you look at all of these different the different, you know, unwind formats and the solutions that these applications are adopting that the unwind format, the unwind metadata has to be generated in the tool chain, right? It is the best suited entity to generate um, the unwind metadata. So this is where CDF frame format fits in. So thinking here is that if you can tap these requirements and come up with a format supported in tool chain, it ought to help these um, applications for just backtracing. So the requirements that CTF frame aims to target is um, the allow for have a C, have a format which allows you to um, unwind from well backtrace from any instruction. Uh, keep the format simple and compact. So do not have any complex expression encodings and no stack machine, so that the unwinding business itself is simple and easy. And with original value of the arguments at the point of function call. Now, as I talk about CTF frame format today, please note that this, um, this support for original value of the arguments is not included in the specification at this time, but I do plan to get to this soon. And the thinking, so I do realize that um, adding support for this can go either way, but as, as in it can get complicated pretty quickly on the format. So the thinking here that I have is maybe we first try with something like an additional offset. And uh, the, the, so the original value of the arguments are saved onto the stack. If the application so desires to recover the original value of the arguments, have the application save them to the stack and somehow just convey in the unwind format that this is where your um, Original, val original value of the arguments are. So that's my uh, take at this time, but I will of course discuss as this evolves. And um, so that's it. So hopefully at this point I have conveyed um, the problem space and where is it that CTF frame can help. And now we discuss how is it that it can help. So I'll discuss the unwind format. So CTF frame, um, it's a simple unwind format for virtual stack unwinding, only backtracing. So it only allows you to recover the minimal necessary state. So CFA 
FP, the frame pointer, and the array. So by frame pointer, I mean it could be either RBP, you know, on x86, or LR on AR64, and so on. So, uh, and the important thing to keep in mind here is that if you just want to do the plain vanilla unwinding, you do not need to go to the CTF type um, debug section. These two are going to be um, independent of each other. When we do provide the information to recover the original value of the arguments, maybe the unwinders and the users might want to figure out, okay, what are the types of the things that I've just read from memory? In those cases, yeah, you may want to go to CDF, but for plain vanilla unwinding and maybe even recovering the original value, CDF frame unwind section should be enough. And at this time, the support is only for x 6664 and um, AR64. This one? Um, if, if CTF frame is meant to be separate from CTF, why do you have such similar names? Why don't have a completely different name? Yes, I've, I have done mental exercises on this, why, and so the, the, argument, the thinking here is that at some point you'll go to the CTF section for figuring out the types. That's when the association makes sense, that one of the thing. And the second is that in principle, we do want to follow the similar things that CTF tries to do, as in just encode the minimal necessary information that is needed for those use cases, right? So uh, first is just, yeah, it's, it's in principle similar. And second is that you will go tie up with CTF in cases, but I'm not tied to it. Yeah, it makes sense if, if we want to rename it to something more meaningful, I think it's, it still works. Yeah. 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 It's true. Yeah. 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 No, it's not. No. Yeah, we could just name it to something as simple as yeah, just unwind or backtrace or something minimal. True. So, yeah, so let's get into further details about what the format looks like. So um, there is a new section that has been added. This is the dot uh, .ctf frame section. Uh, this is an allocated section, and it appears in a segment of its own, so the unwinder can start quickly. The CTF frame section, if you look at it, and if you had previously seen CTF sections, you will see some similarities between the way information is laid out uh, so there are three main subsections in a CDF frame, the CDF frame header, the CDF frame, um, the function descriptor entry subsection, and there is a CDF frame row entry subsection. I will get into the details maybe, yeah, yeah, so okay, so let's look at the, so uh, maybe diagrammatically it's, uh, yeah, this is a better slide, so CDF frame header, and then the function descriptor entries, and then the frame row entries. Um, let's just, uh, yeah, so let's just say that in, from this slide, the main takeaway is that the way to go around getting information from CTF frame is that you follow offsets, right? So, so you first land at the header. If you want to go figure out where is the unwind information for a function, so you figure out the, uh, the offset of the FDE where all the function information is stored, and inside this FDE you have the offset for the, you know, the, back, the, the, the unwind information exactly here. So yeah, I think the only takeaway from this slide for now is information is organized in these three different subsections, and the way to recover information is usually, no, it's always using uh, offsets. So CTF frame header contains very, um, yeah, basic information, which is that first it identifies what is the ABI or the architecture that you're working with. So it, at this time, it identifies three of these flavors. Um, there is a flag, the flag um, eight bits for the flag. At this time, there are two flags. One of them says, the first one is CTF frame uh, F FDE sorted, which basically says that the, uh, the Function descriptor entries in this section are sorted on the start PC. And the second is F frame pointer. Now I added this and my thinking was, um, isn't it useful for the unwinders to know that the application had 
been compiled with frame pointer. So I thought it was, and I added it, but my trouble here right now is that I have no way of generating it in the assembler because the assembler doesn't know. Um, uh, so if you have some solutions there, or if you think this is not so useful, then we can take a second you know, opinion on this. <laughs> so moving on. There is the CTF function descriptor entry. So think of this, uh, so this is, I, I think Dwarf also calls the frame descriptor at uh, the FDEs, so this is very similar. In principle, it wants to convey the same, similar information that at a function level, what do you need to know to unwind, right? So in this case, what you convey in the function descriptor entry is um, what is the function size and bytes, what is the start PC, and what is the FRE type. We will talk about this FRE type, so basically think of different encodings that are allowed in the format for an FRE, and at this level you identify, okay, what is it that I'm going to see in the memory, and the number of FREs. Again, let's wait for a bit, we'll figure out what FRE is. This is a fixed length encoding, and this allows the unwinder to quickly do a binary search. If you want to figure out, you know, if the, if, when the unwinder wants to know, where is the unwind information. Um, yes, so CDF frame row entry, um, it's a variable length entry, and uh, what it tells you is the following. So for a range of addresses, for a range of addresses starting at a specific offset, how is it that I should unwind? And the only thing that it gives you is uh, the offset. So it tells you these are the stack offsets from where you can recover the CFA or FP or the return address, right? So it is a self-sufficient record. It is a self-sufficient record that contains this unwind information, and it is for a range of contiguous addresses. Now, you may note that I do say RA offset, but for some architectures, you don't need that offset because, say, for x86, you know that this is uh, going to be saved on the uh, stack always. So, you know, so once you recover the CFA, then it's known where the RA is going to be. So, yes, yeah, so this, now I'm getting into more, you know, precision around how we have encoded the CTF frame row entry data structure. So basically there are two of these knobs using which you try to make it as compact as possible. So think of a function where, you know, so you know how large is this function is going to be. So if it is small, then you can also, so you can use the number of bits uh, needed to encode the addresses. Um, based on the size of the function. So that's the first knob. So you figure out what, how many bits do I need to encode this uh, address offset. So you have a choice between one byte, two byte, and four byte. And the second sort of knob is the stack frame offsets. So also a function may not go into you know, large areas of the stack offset. And once it is known how much is that range, you can pick a accordingly sized offset. So uh, Okay, so tying it all together, we know that there are these three knobs you can play around, so which is why there are three of these uh, different data structures. They are very similar looking, but the way they vary is um, in the number of bits that you use to encode the address. So I'm using a GNU pickle, poke pickle here. It has been lifesaver throughout, so <laughs> it's also lifesaver here. It conveys clearly what is it that the CTF FRE looks like. So, the, so this is the uh, CTF FRE address one, which basically says that the, for start addresses, I'm going to use just eight bits. And, after, and the, after that, there is a fixed length structure, which is FRE info. So think of this, again, as some sort of metadata that you need to know as you go on to read these um, offsets. So these are the three stack offsets. And basically what will appear is either all 8-bit offsets or all 16-bit or all 32. So these are the stack offsets using which you recover the CFA, FP, and RA. Right? So this is address 1. And again, the second data structure is for 16-bit addresses um, in the function. And address 4 is 32 bits. So um, yeah. So with this, I hope I have given you some understanding of the format. So we tie it up all together. So we saw that there were three of these subsections. Um, the header, we talked about what is, the F, what is the FDE, the function descriptor entry, what does it look like? And then we saw what, are, what is the data structures that you could use for, how is the FRE representation? So um, now what we add in this uh, slide here is 
how is it that the information lookup is done and how do you make it fast? So first is this, that the CTF FDEs are in ascending order of start PC. So this essentially serves the same purpose as each frame header, right? So it allows you, it's an index. It allows you to uh, quickly find out where the information, where the unwind information is going to lie. And the second thing that you note here is that the FREs of a function are always contiguous. Well, yeah. And so the way to land to an FRE is when you have an FTE, it gives you the offset of where the FREs are going to lie for that function. Now, a function may have variable number of FREs, of course, right, depending on how it changes the stack as the control flow in it changes. And there is no necessity for, so if the FDEs are in a specific order, there is no necessity that the FREs be also in the same order. The, the only, limit, the only um, constraint here is that, sure, the FREs of a function have to be together. So it's not really a limitation per se, but it's just I'm saying it out loud so that you know, some of these things are clearer as we go. So with that said, there, we talked right now about the CTF frame format. This is being uh, specified in the CDF frame header, the definition you can see in the CDF frame header at this, po at this point. And there is also GNU poke pickles. It could use some more documentation, but it is up to date. Definition-wise, it's up to date. It could use some more comments, which I will add. Uh, so we talked about CDF frame format, why, it's, why it can solve some of these problems and how it can solve some of these problems, right? Uh, it's, a sm it's a simple unwind format that allows you to just simply, you know, it's fast and simple to backtrace. Um, before I wrap up this part of the section, I do want to share this slide. And with this, I do not want to convey any, anything like this is way smaller than EHFrame or not. Uh, EHFrame is great at what it does. It's very compact, so the, when I started working on the CDF frame stuff, I was a bit worried that because this format encoding looks like interpreted dwarf, is it going to be too large or where is it going to land? So if it is large, then we still have to think twice about it. Um, so it is in a reasonable ballpark. So these numbers are basically, I compiled bin utils with CTF frame support and the linker is merging these uh, the linker is merging the CTF frame sections, and what I see is an average of point a, so 0 0.80, and for AR64, it's 0.7. There is a gotcha in case of AR64 in the sense that I haven't dealt with PLT or the veneer. So the unwind information for PLT and veneer in case of AR64 is not being generated, but I will get to that. For on x86, though, it is being done. So. It seems that it is generating CTF frame section information for most of the code out there. So it looks promising. It looks reasonable range. So uh, it's good. So tying it up all together, we see that there are some of these application-specific proposals that are out there. There is CTF frame that we talked about today. And we know of dwarf-based solution, which is based on EH frame. So I just want to put it all together and just give you a perspective of where do all of these uh, lie. So asynchronicity, um, dwarf is great. It just does it perfectly. Um, for CTF frame, I do want to point out that it is almost asynchronous. I do have a slide. We'll talk about it. But it is close. I do skip some CFI directives, but I think it's very close. Um, for application-specific proposals, I said a yes with a star because often, so from what I have seen for these application-specific proposals is that uh, by de specification-wise, these formats are asynchronous, but because these um, applications are generating these, this format in, in an offline scenario where, uh, as in, you do, you, you use you do some reverse engineering on the binary, you do skip some constructs, and you don't un generate unwind information for the complete application, which is why they start falling into the you know, almost asynchronous range again. So, uh, and then fast, um, CTF frame does provide you fast unwinder, unwinding mechanism. Um, it's, the unwind info itself is small. Um, and application-specific CDF is not application-specific, but the other application-specific proposals, well, two of them that I know of are application-specific. There is always some construct which ties them to the application. And it's not a, well, 
it's not a bad idea. If you know of your application, you have some quirks, sure, exploit it. But it doesn't translate well as in, yeah, you have all these problems of this bifurcating space of so many unwind formats, and then, you know, at some point, your generation logic just, you hit a, you hit a bottleneck as in scaling your um, generation logic and so on. Um, yeah, so which is why I, which is what I want to get at mainly is that the, mo the value proposition here is that the CDF frame format is being generated in the tool chain. So all of those problems are actually taken care of, provided you still are interested in only these two architectures, of course. Yeah. <laughs> so it's, um, uh, yeah. Uh, but we could, we could talk about it. Like, we could see what other architectures may need, and we can extend this. But at least, at least it's the first right step of doing it in the tool chain, I think. Um, so with that, I'm going to move to the implementation status. If there are any questions around the format in general, um, so my my assumption is that the reason you can have uh, the the size savings of twenty percent in in the CTF format is because you're not representing any other registers, and so. It seems like you're proposing to increase the the size of the loaded uh, unwind information by 80 percent. By 80 percent, no, but um, but yes, if you look at it from that perspective, it is increased on metadata. But because the two formats are so different, this is bound to happen, right? So unless you do it in an interpreted, unless you store the stack offsets directly, it's going to be costly. And that's the whole reasoning why, why it ends up being CPU intensive as you unwind using EH frame. So. <clears throat> Have you looked at using only the parts of the EA frame that define uh, the CFA PC. And, uh, I wonder how far you get with it. So, so your question is, if you just use the unwind, if you just use the CFA, FP, and RA stuff from the EH frame, right? So yes, so you, you do need to write an unwinder. So whatever feedback we have had, and the reason why we got into designing all this is the main argument there was, can we do something without the stack machine? Now, I haven't done any measurements. Um, well, uh, why, what, what the specific objection to a stack machine is. I mean, that's I, it's a particular representation uh, the the specific dwarf unwind information mostly doesn't doesn't mess with uh, the dwarf location uh, stack machine at all. Only in only in uh, corner cases, mostly you say uh, at this point the CFA is in this register. That's that's looking through the table. At the So you do need to execute these dwarf opcodes, right, to figure out these stack offsets. So that's one of the argument that this is a CPU intensive activity, and maybe if there is a simpler way to do it, just give me the offset somehow. So then this is taken care of, right? So as in, so this reduces your overall cost that you will incur to unwind. That's one. And I was about to say something more to it, and. I, I forget. So we would, uh, yeah, I, I had to add something more there, but I, it, it will come back to me and then I'll <laughs> come back to you. Hmm. Um, if, if a function gets split over multiple address ranges, say a hot section and a cold section, does the format capture that? Yes. Yes, so, so, so for whatever start, proc, end proc tuples that you have, it will generate an FTE. So, it will, and so in that sense, it is oblivious to saying this is the function boundary. It just says these are the contiguous ranges that I think are you know, blocks of contiguous, it's, it's piece of a function, so to speak, and this is the unwind information for it. 
Um, yeah. Yes, so coming to, I, I know what came to my mind. So I, I uh, there is a use case, um, which is system-wide profiling via BPF. Now for that, um, BPF has a lot of restrictions in terms of what you can run. The verifier doesn't accept much of it, and I think Jose can also add on to that. So in that, I think it is very unlikely that we can run an EH frame-based unwinder. Why? Because I think there it'll be it'll get difficult to estimate what is it that the memory size what is it what is the stack size that I should assign for this activity. Right? So and I have run into a couple of entities which are interested in just doing that. So how would you do that if you do not have something like a simple unwind format that just lets you agreed that if you want to do something like system-wide profiling via BPF, you, are, you do have to go to your customers asking to compile all your applications with CTF frame if, if this is what solves their problem. So that exists, yes. Um, but... Just to give a little bit of context, because I know it sounds like weird, and actually it is. Uh, <laughs> but that's how the real world is. It's scary and weird. Um, the kernel used to have a Dorf unwinder, Dorf based unwinder. They removed it for whatever reasons. I'm not getting into that because I don't know the details and I don't know. I was not there at the time. So currently what they do is that they, um, to unwind uh, kernel code, they have a, a tool called object tool that which is one of those other specific application-specific proposals to say that um, reverse engineer the unwind information from the object files. And it puts, it encodes that, the back in, that unwind information into a new format that the kernel hackers designed called ORC. Now, this is reverse engineered from the object from the instructions. They look at the functions, they reconstruct the control flow graph, they do all that. Why don't they do that from the Yeah, well, nah, nah. The thing is that this ORC format, which is not that unsimilar from CTF frame, is actually kernel specific because it relies on things like, oh, in the kernel we don't have functions bigger than this, for example. So now they have an ORC and winder in the kernel, which is trusted, and it is simple because it's a very simple format to unwind. Now, the problem they have now, as far as we know, is what happens if you want to unwind the user land stacks in the kernel, right? And this is the use case that we have been, we have been talked about recently of people who want to unwind the user land stacks from the kernel. Now you will say, okay, let's use the H-frame. How? You will not get an H-frame based on winder in the kernel because they removed it for whatever reasons they had. I don't think they have changed their mind. The, you cannot use ORC because ORC is kernel specific. It has size limitations. So, sorry? Yeah, they also yeah they uh, they also try to support ARM. I think they are having problems with that. Have to make some changes to get to AR64, but yes, at this time it's it's it is. Um, at so, yeah. So now, well, just to finish. So they were thinking, okay, let's do for I, with, I don't know why, but they mentioned to do this to do this using BPF programs, right? So. Um, we actually we are not 100 percent sure that it is actually possible to write a BPF program that can unwind CTF frame and pass the verifier in the kernel. But uh, each frame, no way, no way. It is too complicated for for something like this for the verifier. Yeah. Also, there is memory allocation. I think we can unwind uh, CTF frame with, with without allocating memory, which is also something that can in some situations. Yeah. Yes, that's true, yeah. So is the big advantage of this format then that once you find the correct um, FRE, that pretty much that has all the information that you need to figure out where the CFA is, 
and the, the return address, as opposed to um, EH frame where you have to start at the beginning of the list and go through until you find the appropriate instruction. So pretty much it's doing that, I guess that decode, so it's just a, a single lookup rather than stepping through. So memory traversal wise, um, you will go to the FREs one after the other, but you won't read all the contents of the FRE, but because it's a variable length FRE, you have to land at the first place, read something and then skip some bytes and so on. So there are memory accesses, but you're not executing any opcodes. In case of EH frame, you will execute. So because that's the... Uh, so uh, one question is uh, for the producers, you have a uh, compiler now producing CTF. Do you have also assembler directives because for for dwarf frame info, uh, we have a lot of uh, handwritten assembly assembly with, with uh, unwind information in it, for instance, in glibc. So yes, uh, I will talk about the implementation aspects next, but this is a, there is a new command line argument that's passed to assembler and which will, basically what it will do is process all the CFI directives and generate CTF frame. So it's not a, so does that answer it? It's an additional um, command line argument and a directive. So if you have handwritten assembly with um, CFI directives, it should still flow fine and you should have CTF frame information for it, just like you had EH frame information for it. The assembler generated it and linker did the necessary. Similar flow should work, does work for... Um... I don't know, do I have to go back to answer? Sorry. Uh, well, uh, I, I wanted to get whether you have um, something that create CTF from, from dwarf unwind information because at that point it would be interesting to see how big coverage of what dwarf actually, what uh, dwarf unwind information we actually have in libraries like glibc can actually this format handle because uh, dwarf unwind information is, is pretty simple for the most cases, even trivial. Uh, but uh, it's, it's complex because it can handle the very complex cases like uh, swap context and stuff like that in glibc or for instance AVX dynamic stack reallocation uh, realignment where, where you need to use extra registers and dynamically uh, adjust the, yeah, align the stack, stack pointer. So can, can CTF handle those cases? So representation-wise, um, representation-wise, so I, I, I do not know the specifics of the cases you just mentioned, but representation-wise, I think it can. Is that a true statement, do you think? So, so the question, so if you just, so the, I'll put the question differently. If you just, if you have means to, uh, to clearly indicate that this is how to recover CFA, FP, and RA, is that sufficient or do you need some other like so there are some things that are implicit here which is that for x86 once you figure out the cfa the ra has to be on the stack so these these assumptions so if these are not violated ctf frame can represent it that will not work no no no, no. Hi, so, can, you, can you hear me yes uh, great uh, at least on PowerPC, uh, the, the return address can be in any general purpose register. Yes. Always. Yes. So at this time, we are only supporting x86-64 and AR-64. So... Right, but you want to support everything, right? If there is need for it, we can work it out. But if, yeah. So if that is the case, then you will have to extend and represent um the different registers then it's just similar to to dwarf and then i think it'll lose its um it'll lose the whole um 
advantage uh, because it is blue. Right, exactly. Yeah. Well, it we can try, but the, the the size of this information will just go way high up. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, maybe I go on quickly to just discuss the implementation. I have 15 minutes, and um, uh, we added we have patches that we posted for support in the assembler linker, OBJ dump, and Redelf. Um, V6 patches were posted and reviewed. I have to work on them. I will um, as soon as I get back. And uh, most of the review comments have been taken care of, but I have a few things to do there. So the GCC side of it, it hasn't been done yet, but the thing that I have to do now is there was the CTF info level one, and which, which can be tied to, which will be tied to CTF frame information, and all that the compiler will need to do there is generate something like C5 sections uh, CTF frame. And I'm assuming even for other Debug, and even for other unwind information, you do enable the F uh, asynchronous unwind and so on. So that's something similar here. But this patch is not yet done, and I haven't posted it. What is done is, some, is all that the bin utils needs to do, which is that in assembler, we added a new um, command line argument, which is minus minus GCTF frame, um, which generates a CTF frame section. The linker merges as necessary, and OBG dump read of support. Um, so there. There do remain two ways to create the CTF frame section. One is minus minus GCTF frame, and the other is to give the directive, which the compiler will do once the support is in. Um, internally, in the assembler, the CTF frame generation logic feeds off the internal dwarf structure. So once the assembler has done processing the CFI directives, it generates the internal dwarf representation, like these data structures, and then CTF frame generator kicks in, and it translates the information and dumps out the CTF frame unwind information. There is, a, there is an optimization that's put in place, which basically is the selection logic for FREs. So you saw how the different FREs vary in size, and it's only done using uh, you know, fragment fix-up, because at the point that you generated these fragments, you didn't know how long these have to be, so you fix it up. So yeah, short summary being, um, there is a small, there is an optimization at this time, which is enabled for both AR64 and X6664 targets. And uh, what it does is it fixes up the length of bits that you need to encode a couple of uh, bits of data in the CTF frame section. Uh, now this is the asynchronicity part. I think it's important I talk it out and get some feedback from you folks. Um, there are some of these CFI directives which are just skipped for CTF frame generation. Um, some of it is harmless, right? Because CTF frame says that I'm going to only give you enough information for plain vanilla backtracing. So some of it, some of the information you skip, and that's okay. But the information that you should not skip, and which is what is making it asynchronous at this time, is this CFI escape. Now the cases when the compiler does generate CFI escape, um, I did not have an easy way to, you know, parse it and process it in the assembler. At this time, I've skipped it, but I think there can be a middle ground where I can go process some simple CFI escape uh, you know, directives. But for the complex ones, I still have no solution in mind. And for the negate RA state, this affects AR64 only, right? Um, and um, basically, this says that if what you stored on the stack, if the return address on the stack is encrypt, is, is, has some sign bits, on the higher side, then there are CFI directives that tell the unwinder that as you go about, read something from the stack, uh, just take care that the upper bits are, are not addressed exactly. So this is again not supported, which means that if your program has uh, these pack, the pack use pack in star instructions, then there will be a CFI RA escape and CTF frame will not be generated at all for that function block. And this is, this, these are the two cases where it's making it asynchronous. Um, again, I, that's why I just said almost, because it seems close, but uh, it won't be fair if I say it's fully asynchronous. So if you know of something that can help us out here, again, much appreciated. And so, so implementation, again, what the patches do provide is a library. Um, this library interface is given and includes CTF frame API, and it helps you encode and decode and dump it in textual format. 
Um, the usual stuff, so it gives you these access APIs. So given a PC, you can quickly find the FRE. Well, you can find the FRE. And then given an FRE, you have APIs to say what, is the, what are all of these offsets. Um, this library is used by the linker and also the CTF frame unwinder. So we have written a small, Vimin has written a small uh, unwinder which sits in the, uh, which, is, which is provided via libctf backtrace. It allows you to unwind using um, CTF frame section. I will talk about libctf backtrace. I do have some questions there, as in where does it sit exactly? Where should it sit? Um, linker implementation, I think we can skip. It's straightforward. It just says that, you know, as a linker merges these input sections, it also makes sure that these FDEs are in sorted order so the unwinder can, you know, work about it quickly. Uh, it sets the CTF FRE F FDE sorted flag. And um, that's it. On x86, we do generate unwind information for PLT. This, there remains a to-do for AR64. I will get to it, and veneers as well on x86, on AR64. Redux support and OBJDM support and small output. It's just, um, yeah, usual stuff. Uh, for CDF backtrace, there is this, so there is this library which, uh, which so, the code sits in Benutil's libctf frame, sure, and the test suite is in libctf frame, test suite, libctf frame, unwind. So there has been, a, there is some unease um, in, just say, in just saying that there is an unwind library which is, you know, which, is, uh, which sits in the code like this, which is still fine, but the trouble here is that we generate this SO only when the, um, assembler supports this GCTF frame because the unwinding, because some of these APIs in the unwind library themselves need CTF frame information. So, which makes the whole testing and deployment a bit difficult. And, um, okay, the slides are not in the same order as I wanted, but, um, so, yeah, this is one of the questions that I had. So, what is the ideal place for something like an unwinder which is based on CTF frame? Uh, libctf backtrace doesn't seem to be a very ideal place. Maybe lib unwind or maybe lib backtrace. So between these two, I, we, what is it that there is a you know, general feeling on which one should we try? So the trouble with lib backtrace is that it seems to be for symbolic backtraces and it seems to serve the case where you want a little more informative backtrace. And for lib unwind, well, this isn't really unwind. This is just, you know, simple vanilla backtracing. So either way, there is some dil dilu dilution to, to the purpose of these libraries, but it needs to sit somewhere else, it's at least my opinion. So if you have any ideas on that, um, it will be welcome. But, so going back to what libctf frame libctf backtrace library gives you is this API called ctf backtrace. So you provide it a buffer of a specific size and it returns, it fills up this buffer uh, and returns you what size, what is the number of records that it has filled up with, basically just PCs. And it sets an error point error code if there is any error. And um, Um, yeah, so if there are any questions, I can take them, but otherwise I'll go talk about what I see as my next steps, immediate ones. If you find the format useful or not, just give us any feedback there. And um, so, okay, sure, I'll continue with the next steps. So I do have to get to these patches and, you know, fix up some things and address the review comments. Um, the specification document will come. I do want to get to writing something like what we did for CTF, so it's clear and you know, uh, helps anyone who's reading or working on this format. Uh, for AR64, I do want to get to these two items because there seem to be some interest even in the, uh, uh, the Linux kernel guys. So I'll try it out and at some point I do want to see how all of this works out on AR64 once, you know, um, this support is in. Um, after all of this has settled and um, we want to get into adding support for recovering original value of the arguments. So uh, there were some proposals uh, out there which were basically uh, arguing for adding an additional column in EH frame. I think that also fits with this here that maybe you know we, we, we follow with adding additional support in CTF frame because I think it keeps the whole thing very compact and easily, um, easily recoverable um, original value of the arguments. 
And I think that is all I have. If you have questions, we can take them. You mentioned uh, supporting this in BPF. Does that mean that you're thinking about getting this into like the kernel for doing the uh, sampling uh, back traces then? Is that one of your next steps there? Or? So uh, at least, uh, so if, if, it, if that is one of the next steps, somebody will have to, you know, jump in and try it out. But the only intention that I had was to try it out if it works for that use case, which is that I do want to try if I can unwind user space stacks, user space stack traces. So that would be my first step. I could try also via BPF, but then that's the next step because BPF has more restrictions. And, and then if it goes to other use cases that you want to sample or you know, collect more stack traces for other purposes, uh, sure. At least I was wanting to go one by one and that seems to be you know, the next in line after the first two things. So for recovering the original arguments, you think that users are going to be willing to, to accept the cost of all the extra stack space in each, in each call to a function? We have, yeah. So at least they are interested. Now, there is an obvious argument there. People will say, you know, yeah, users might say that this is not something I want to do for sure. We have a solution already for that space, right? If you don't want to use it, EH frame works very well, right? It's just, um, it's best suited there. But if you do want to pay that overhead, there is this option you could use, yeah. In fact, even, so this saving on stack space is orthogonal. You, at some point, it might also be a good idea for adding it to EH frame. And in that way, maybe some of the, I don't know, so you were comment, you were hinting at that, so I'm not sure if I make that statement, it's true. So if you do have a stack offset, which tells you where, the st where these arguments lie on stack, maybe some of the overhead of unwinding that people complain about is now that argument goes wide because you do not have to recover using EH frame. You can go recover via, I don't know. So yeah, it's, it's just a supposition at this time and maybe it'll help. Unwinded. We were wondering where to put it. Uh, there is a, this lead backtrace in Binutils that, to be honest, I did not know it existed until I looked. Um, I think it's only used by GDB. Is it used by GDB? So you, you've got right. You've got your FREs right, which are variable length at the moment. I was wondering if you could make them fixed length, and also um, so the, the variable part you actually have another level in direction. You move that off, right? So you have a fixed length FRE, and in in the FDE, the function you say how many FREs there are, 
uh, and the FREs are address sorted. So then you don't need to go through scanning one by one by one to find the one you want. You know, you, you do a simple binary sort or something to find the actual entry. So you speed up the lookup that way. And because the, they're fixed sizes, you just leap about. And I suspect that um, the information about where to find the CFA and the RA is going to be similar for lots of different functions. So you don't have to record that information lots of time. So you make the f file format smaller. Well, the, the so I also thought about it. I had it in my mind too that maybe it's a better way. So yeah, I think what you're saying is the same thing, which is that as you see, most of the time, many functions will have a similar looking offset. So what you can do is make this um, fixed size, make the first part fixed size and have additional subsection where you store these, all of these offsets. Yes, it will make it much more compact because this information is highly repetitive and there is a good amount of it that can be just pruned off. If I have to, if I can, and I think I want to say a number, it will be at least 50% down for sure, minimal. So it will turn it down, but yeah, we could try it. And there will just be one more memory access additional to get to that, in, you know, you use that indirection, but that's fine. Yes. 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 I'll have to see because the assembler is very um, specific in the way it generates stuff and then keeping a map of stuff, it just, yeah, I'll have to think about it. If it's easy enough to do in the assembler, I had it in mind, on my mind too. Yes, thank you. Yeah. Can you unwind through PLT slot? Because that's, that's quite complex. Uh, at least in, in dwarf uh, frame information, it's, it's very complex dwarf expression that allows you to com compute who actually called you. So interesting. I didn't cover that at all. But there is an encoding that we put in. Um, there is an encoding enhancement that we put in just for PLT. So yeah, for PLT, yeah, dwarf encodes is in a CFI expression, but the expression itself is easy in the sense that you can encode that whether the addresses are, so yeah, dwarf encodes is in an expression. So we took, we took it on CDF frame format then to add an additional enhancement so you can encode that information still in a small size. So there is an additional bit that identifies that this FRE is for PLT. And instead of this being an offset, treat it as a mask. So just like for EPLT, for on x86, what you say is um, you, add, you see the last two bits, right? So you see, there is a pattern of instruction. So basically, you just encode it, saying that rather than treating offset, treat it as a mask. So that gives you that striding pattern. So it is encoded, that one. It's a special case, yes. So we had to do it, because otherwise, you lose that capability. and. Yeah, asynchronicity was something that we have been trying to get as much as we can and get 200%. So that was a big, um, you know, that was a needed addition. And another special case I, I see in the uh, AMD 64 um, GLIPC is is the restore RT. Uh, so, so signal frame, if, if it's something you can handle. Yes. So, Vemin, I don't know if you're online. Um, Vemin, are you online? No. So, he has been looking at that, and he will send something. <laughs> so, yeah. But the signal frame thing, yes, the CTA frame format does not yet even indicate that this is a signal frame. Maybe that's also something we need, because Unwinder might find it easier if it's encoded clearly that this is a signal frame and unwind so and so. But thank you, yes. <laughs> 